Ontario. I'm also the chair of the CWIL PD committee. I'd like to thank my committee members for their work all year in bringing this event together. Aaron Kapanen at UCalgary, Sandy Howe at Brock, Natalie Roper at Concordia, and Robin Luty at UBC. This is a webinar presented by CWIL Canada's Professional Development Committee to all members to provide supportive information to enable you and your students to be successful this summer under the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's event was developed with the remote student in mind. The vast majority of students in work integrated learning opportunities will not be installed in conventional workplaces. Rather, they'll be working remotely, presumably like many of us from their homes and residences. To address this new dynamic, we've asked experts to bring two institutional perspectives and the employer's perspective. Your presenters are Lauren Broderick, career advisor and career leader, program supervisor at the University of Waterloo. Shandy Johnston, student advisor at the University of Waterloo. And Brian Convery, national leader, early talent acquisition at RBC and CWIL Canada board member. Now, most of you are expert Zoom attendees by now, but for your viewing pleasure, you may wish to do the following. Switch to speaker view from an icon at the top of your screen. Switch to side-by-side -side view similarly when a presenter is sharing their screen with slides up. And finally, take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat window. Name, institution, please. We'll be recording the presentation for sharing with other CWIL members who were not able to attend. And if you're having tech problems, place those in the chat space and Mark will take care of it. There will be a time for questions at the end. Lauren and Shandy will present for about 15 minutes total and Brian similarly. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And you may wish to address the question to an appropriate person. I will curate the questions for the end of the event, and I'll also be sharing specific links in the chat space during the presentations as I'm guided by the presenters. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Lauren who will introduce herself and then introduce Shandy. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bruce. Um, just gonna share my screen here. Um, if you can confirm once you see it, there it is. Wonderful. Just put it in the full screen. All right, is it there? Yes. Perfect. Okay, yes. And thank you so much again. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us today to, to connect with everyone. So first of all, who we are. So as Bruce mentioned, my name is Lauren Broderick and I'm a career advisor as well as a career leader program supervisor for the Center for Career Action at the University of Waterloo. This means that I advise students on co-op and career related topics, as well as oversee a team of student staff that offer drop-in career supports. And I'm Shandy Johnston, and I'm a student advisor also at the University of Waterloo. And primarily my role, I support students while they are on their co-op work terms. Um, so supporting them in the workplace and throughout their term. Great. So we recognize that there's a lot of information available right now on working remotely, and we won't be able to touch on all of it today. But what we do hope to share is what we found to be the most helpful when working with students ourselves. So I'm going to um, so today I'm going to start by talking a bit about how to help students prepare for a successful work integrated learning experience working remotely, focusing on three themes of communication, productivity, and wellness. And then Shandy's gonna take over by talking about how to support students during the remote work integrated learning experience, focusing on the themes of connection, support, and feedback. So let's start by looking at communication. So one of the best ways to ensure a successful start to any role for a student 
is to reach out to say their supervisor or maybe the HR administrator and ask about, you know, see if there's a plan or schedule for the first day. So no longer are the days when students will walk into the office and someone's gonna be there to greet them at the door and take them to where they need to be. Um, so if students haven't been sent instructions, it's really, it would be really great for them to reach out and see if there is a plan for their first day. So I know for us, a week before our spring co-op students started, we sent them a schedule of who they'd be meeting with and what time, so they knew exactly what to expect going into that first day. So prior to the first week or when they begin, students should also identify a few things such as expectations. You know, what are the working hours? Is it an 8.30 to 4.30 position? Is it a 9 to 5? Um, is it flexible hours? as well as the preferred communication method or style for their supervisor um, and colleagues. And I know I, um, Shandy's gonna talk a bit about um, communication, communication methods as well, and, and I'm sure Brian will um, as well. But you know, things to consider, um, what method or platform do they prefer? Um, you know, does the team prefer video or voice when connecting for meetings? I'll also share that a number of the students that I have um, worked with have mentioned that an instant messaging option is really, really valuable. That way, if they have an urgent question or concern where they might typically have popped into, you know, their head into their supervisor's door, using instant messenger, they're able to reach out and get a quick answer. And then, you know, for those um, less time sensitive questions, they can save those for email. So it might be worth students asking if there is an instant messaging option for their workplace. They also might, you know, should identify the frequency of meetings, one-on-ones, or check-ins. Students should also prioritize clear community. So when communicating in writing, even our closest friends can sometimes misinterpret in our intentions when we send notes online. And these can be costly, both time-wise and anxiety-wise. So it's essential to be ultra clear in one's communication, especially when students are first establishing relationships with their supervisors and colleagues. Research reported in the Harvard Business Review's remote article indicates that more it's more important to be clear than to be brief, even though brevity is often associated with efficiency. So students should spend their time or um, should spend their time to communicate with intention and know that they can never really be too clear. And finally, it's important for students to find ways to build strong connections with colleagues through various communication channels. You know, it, it's not being in the office, we don't have those opportunities to connect over lunch in the lunchroom or, you know, to chat before, you know, while we're waiting for a meeting to start. So finding other ways to connect is gonna be really valuable. In regard to productivity, one thing that is most likely top of mind for students is setting up their office space. And one of the most Important considerations is identifying and minimizing distractions. So whether the distractions are people, possibly pets, I know I've seen a lot of pets in, in meetings these days, um, or devices, they should try to set limits and boundaries. So for example, maybe let people know when they won't be able to talk or put devices such as personal phones or gaming systems away. Um, another student I spoke with last week mentioned that what they're planning to do when they start their role is to set up a workspace in a completely separate room from where they typically watch Netflix, Netflix and play games. And we'll use a separate device so they aren't tempted by these distractions. In terms of organizing their day, um, you know, I've had some students that say the date, you know, before they wrap up the day before, they plan out the following day or that morning of. They really set this, you know, look at what needs to be accomplished that day and set the stage so they're more motivated to get everything done that they need to get done that day. It can also be really important to implement a time management technique. So there are several different techniques the Pomodoro technique where you spend 25 minutes working on a task followed by a three to five minute break. There's also a study that recommends we do 45 minutes of intense work followed by a five to 10 minute break. So, you know, students can try out these different time management techniques and see what's going to work best for them. Several of the students that I work with have also found value in finding a productivity partner, someone they can connect with and hold each other accountable for the work they get done. So some of them, you know, maybe it's in a meeting, others, they just, you know, put each other online and just check in and make sure they're getting their work done. They've found different strategies to, to make this work. Um, you just want to make sure it's not somebody who will contribute to distractions. That's the key to that piece. 
And finally, encourage students to check in regular, regularly with their supervisor to provide updates on their progress. One of my students said that at their partner's in, uh, new organization, they do daily check-ins where the team gets together just quickly to share what they accomplished that or the day prior and what they plan to accomplish that day. So that's something else that students could potentially suggest to their team as an idea if it's not already set up. And finally, but probably most importantly, make sure students focus on their wellness. Encourage them to take breaks, you know, potentially by using one of the strategies that we've talked about. Get outside, they could go coordinate a walking meeting. I've gone on a few of these myself, not as many as I but I'm gonna try and um, you know, implement more as the weather gets better, but walking meetings can be a great way to both get work done, but also get fresh air, exercise, and be outside. You know, also try to connect for lunches or socials with colleagues or friends. According to a 2018 study in the US featured in the same Harvard Business Review set of articles that I mentioned, um, pre-COVID, loneliness was established as the biggest risk in working from home. Therefore, encourage students to take advantage of any opportunities that come their way to spend time, ideally on video, but some people aren't com comfortable with video or not maybe initially when they start out. Um, but really, you know, spend time with colleagues or others informally learning from and connecting with peers. You know, students should also drink lots of water, eat healthy. It's easy to spend the day snacking at home. I know there's a lot of us on here that can probably relate to that. Um, students should also set boundaries between work and home life. Know when the workday starts and when it ends. Otherwise, you know, the work can easily flow into the evenings. And finally, they should reach out for support. Whether they would benefit from the support from us, from their supervisor, from campus services such as campus wellness or counseling, or support from community partners. Ensure that they know that they are not alone. We are all here to help, to support in any way we can. At the University of Waterloo, we were getting a lot of questions from students and employers about remote work and how to handle this change most effectively. So we put together a short YouTube video that you see on the left and an article you can see on the right to help everyone navigate this together. These two resources include six tips to help students transition to working remotely. They're a great resource for students and for employers who are looking for something to share with their co-op students. You can find both of these resources on our Waterloo Co-op website under the supports and resources section. And Bruce is also going to include these links or the, the links to these resources in the chat box. So Shandy, thank you everyone. Shandy, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks Lauren. So we wanna switch gears a little bit and take some time to talk about some of the ways that practitioners um, specifically can help to support student success as they're transitioning to these remote workplaces. So in our roles al already, we often student and the work integrated learning provider and we really want both to be successful in their goals, especially as we're supporting those learning achievements for students. So Lauren shared a lot of great tips about um, kind of the day-to-day, -day, how students can be successful working remotely that we can share, but we might also need to provide some additional guidance about how to navigate that working relationship. So I'll just share a couple quick notes about some background on my role so you know what perspective I'm coming from. So I primarily support co-op students on four-month paid work integrated learning experiences or co-op terms. So if I use the term employer, just know that it could refer to any possible employers for different types of work integrated learning experience. Um, and at Waterloo, we're divided into regional teams. So I do work with students in all different faculties and programs. Um, and I'm based in Vancouver supporting students in Western Canada and the US. So personally, I've been working remotely for over eight years. But it's still a bit of a transition for me. So in my role, I have a few different touch points or check-ins with students and employers on the work term to connect with them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a bit. But with the transition, practitioners will really want to continue to have these touch points and really make sure to focus on, in particular, with remote work. And as we mentioned before, those three areas might be connection, support, and feedback. So first, we're going to talk about connection. If you want to go to the next slide, Lauren. Yeah, it's not 
clicking over for me. <laughs> it froze and is not letting me control my screen anymore. Um, uh oh, give me a moment. <laughs> I might, I'm just going to um, stop sharing for a moment and see if I can reconnect. Apologies. Oh, no worries. No worries. Thanks, Lauren. So one thing students might experience is technical difficulties. <laughs> we all do. Yes. <laughs> Give me half a sec. Yeah, it's no letting worries. me move it when I took it off screen share. So let's see if it will allow me to come back on. There we are. It's allowed me to join back in. So there, um, can everyone see that? Yep, perfect. Excellent, thank you. Great. Okay, so yeah, like I mentioned, one of the first areas that we're gonna talk about is connection. So that's something that we might wanna focus on right away with the students. Um, you know, especially as we're likely talking about the majority of students starting their summer work experience and onboarding remotely. Um, there are going to potentially be a lot of differences between employers on what this onboarding look, what looks like, depending on their size, their resources, their capacity. Um, but as practitioners, we can really help guide students about ways to build these strong connections in the workplace. Um, so for example, one of the primary relationships is likely going to be with their manager or supervisor. So like Lauren mentioned, encouraging students to figure out what communication strategy is going to work best for both of them. You know, is it going to be a daily check-in, a weekly one-on-one? -on -one? And also recognizing that the manager themselves might be transitioning to managing people remotely, and that could be a big adjustment for them. Um, with their connections with team and coworkers. Again, we really want to encourage students to build their network, to learn from different sources, and to really have the chance to connect with as many different people as possible on their work term. Um, they also want to build connections with other students, especially if there are multiple students at the same employer. It might be really important for them to build those connections with other students going through similar experiences to build that support. Um, and then finally, they also likely want to build some good connections with that employer or the work integrated learning partner that they're working with. So especially if the goal is potentially for a future term or full time work, you really want to think about building those long term connections, which again, could be a challenge when you're not there person um, or a student who is reaching out we might need to have some discussion with them about you know helping them identify people they could go to people they can reach out to uh, really guiding them through some reflection or resource identification about how they can build those strong connections um, and again that might be a role that the practitioner is going to play by providing those suggestions to the students So next we're going to talk a little bit about support. Um, so related to connection, we want the students to be able to build strong relationships to make sure they're supported in their learning goals. Um, and that's going to enable them to contribute during the term. So, and again, as we mentioned before, support is going to be what's so important to that success. So there might be those variations between employers. Some might have a lot of these support tools already built in. So like we mentioned earlier, things like uh, file sharing tools, you know, chat programs like Slack or Teams, while others might not have this set up. So um, if it's not possible for the employer to provide, provide everything that the student needs, how can we help them to come up with solutions if there's an issue? So again, as practitioners, we might be working one-on-one -on -one with students to really identify their unique situation and help them problem solve and be able to address any of these issues. So again, relating back to kind of before remote work, um, one common support concern that I had heard from students a lot in previous terms was that their manager was really busy and not always able to respond quickly or provide immediate support. So in those terms, it was really good to help the student identify a mentor aside from their manager. And that could either be formal, so maybe somebody that's been assigned to them, or maybe informal, a teammate that they know that they can chat with or they can work with, um, or that might be a bit more available for questions. 
Um, but again, this might be harder for them to identify working remotely. They don't necessarily have somebody working in the desk next to them, so they can just, you know, swing over and ask a, a question. They might have to have that person a little bit more um, set up as kind of their go-to for any questions that they have. Uh, next, another great source of support is going to be us as the practitioners. So it's important to be aware of what our check-in points are with the students during the term. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I have a few touch points that we use um, at Waterloo. So one of our main touch points is at the six week mark where we do a check-in with both the manager. Um, so we ask the manager if the student is below meeting or exceeding expectations. And we also have a check-in with the student. So we ask if they're getting feedback, if they're getting support and their overall satisfaction for the term. So this is a really good way for us to gauge how the work term is going and also step in with some early interventions. Um, you know, if there are issues that are identified and we have time to make those changes. And so absolutely this touch point will likely become even more important as the students are working remotely. Um, so as practitioners, we might want to prepare for and anticipate some additional adjustments that we might need to help with um, during this transition to remote. Um, and also the student or the manager might have struggled to build connections and they might have struggled to provide this support. And we also might reach another um, potential area of concern where they can't give this information because they really haven't had a chance to give that feedback. So with that, we'll move into the final area um, that could be a concern, which is the feedback piece. So again, even in previous terms where students were working in person, um, sometimes I would go in or during that checkpoint ask about how their term has been going. And students would often say, I think it's going well, we haven't really had any feedback, but you know, based on kind of my sense from the informal feedback or the nonverbal cues, I think it's going okay. Um, so again, with remote, we really need to make sure that this feedback is effective and consistent. So really having that reminder with both the student and the manager that they will definitely need to have some kind of touch points to have that feedback, really encouraging a midterm review to encourage that consistent and effective feedback. Um, and it's really critical for the student to know what they're doing well and how they can make improvements. With that feedback piece, we also want to make sure that the student has a really clear sense of what's expected and also some ways to make their work visible. And this is really going to vary depending on industry, the nature of the work, um, you know, if they're working on a really specific project where they have deliverables kind of daily or weekly, that's going to be really visible versus maybe something else that's a bit more subjective and, and hard to define. But again, we want to proactively work with the students to help them develop ways to show what they're achieving. Um, and this can even be difficult for seasoned professionals, you know, to really explain, prove, and show what we're working on. And finally, again, as we're all navigating this new normal and really just, you know, trying to figure it out kind of day by day, week by week, um, we really want to have the students to be able to give a chance to give their own feedback. So how has their term been going? Is it meeting their goals? What are the challenges that they're facing? This is really important for the employer to have. It's really great for us as practitioners to have so we can really develop resources to meet those needs um, and just really helpful for all of us. And speaking of feedback, so we did actually wanna share um, on the next slide. So there hopefully will be some information coming out as the Watt case, so the Center for Advancement of Cooperative Education has actually started to research the effects of remote work on the students' experience. So they're specifically looking at students who have transitioned to remote work partway through the winter 2020 term. Um, so it's still a new experience. We're all still learning what this transition will look like and especially from the student's point of view. So they're going to be exploring um, some of the skills, some of the challenges and any advice and should hopefully be able to share some findings soon. So keep your eye out for updates. And so with that, that's the end of our institution um, portion of the presentation. So I'll hand it over to Brian and can't wait to hear a little bit about the employer side. Great. So can you hear me okay? Yes, just fine. Okay. So um, thank you. And um, really, thank you for having me today at, at this discussion. Um, 
what's nice about what we just learned and we just talked about uh, from the folks there is um, a lot of what you talked about is um, now on the receiving end at the employer. And I was just taking some notes down as you were talking and some of the things that you mentioned um, are the exact same things that we've been thinking about as it relates to uh, remote work for students. Uh, so for, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Brian Combrey. I am the National Director for Early Talent Acquisition Canada at RBC. I'm also a board member um, for uh, industry representation on Seawell. Um, many of you I, I know or have worked with. Um, for those of you I have not, it's a pleasure to meet you here today. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about uh, how things are going and share some thoughts and ideas um, and hopefully then we'll open it up for questions. So first up, um, I just want to share this because it was yesterday was a super proud moment at RBC. Um, and I just wanted to share some of the statistics because some people don't actually always hear what's going on behind the scenes. So this summer we had 744 job requisitions and we had 124,000 plus students apply for those jobs. Um, yes, some of them applied six or seven times, but the fact that we had over 124,000 applications, we ended up hiring 1,000 students and we virtually onboarded them on May 24th. We got the go ahead from our president on April 6th. So in less than 30 days, we ended up doing three months of work to bring all of these students on. And I'm super proud of my team and super proud of the organization and the, and the support I get is tremendous. Um, yesterday was our first ever virtual enterprise summer student welcome day and I'm smiling because we had no idea what to expect when we jumped on but you can see by the picture here we had a lot of fun we shared a lot of relevant information um, and we had over 850 students on WebEx with us as we went through um, two and a half hours of programming and discussions and, uh, and a couple games along the way so Again, I just want to share a little bit about the world that we're operating in. Obviously, the scale is, is pretty large, um, but what I'm about to share, I think, is, is, is um, something that all sizes of businesses, small, medium, and large, can actually learn from and, and we can reflect from. And what I most appreciate is my relationships with all of you, that we were in this together and that we can work through this time of um, uncertainty. So just starting out really basic, um, remote work. I even thought about the topic as we were doing it. And the first thing that came to mind was some shack and some destined area was snow covered and nobody really around. And it sort of painted a picture of some doom and gloom for me. And then I thought about, okay, what about virtual work? And then I started thinking about, okay, is this a virtual reality situation where we're all kind of tuning into our day jobs and working with the students and kind of thinking through that. And then working from home, which many of us have experienced um, over the last little while. Most of us were sent home in March and, and most of us have been doing this. Um, and what words come to mind there are pictures. It's many of these things, the laundry, the kids screaming, the dog barking, the doorbell going, um, many things that we all deal with on a daily basis as well as students. And to the earlier points, about distractions and um, having that ability to work. You know, these kind of terms uh, don't necessarily uh, bring positive images or positive situations. So what we've attempted to try to do is, rather than focus on what we call it, what if we focus on the work itself and the student experience? So I'm gonna take you through what I consider meaningful work and what does meaningful work mean? It means, you know, the values, the talents, the interests, the purpose, the mission, everything coming together uh, for that sweet spot for meaningful work for the youth. And just like the youth, we all want meaningful work and purpose. So focusing the conversation a little bit around meaningful work and really what we call it doesn't matter. What's really what it is, is what we deliver and what we, we, we bring to our students. Um, so, First up, really, we had to think about, I'm just gonna move the video a little bit down because I can't see, there we go. Uh, first, we had to talk about engagement. Um, you know, when, when COVID-19 hit, mid-March, we were out on campuses, we were all over, um, you know, meeting students, talking with students, and all of a sudden it went virtual. Um, we weren't quite done, so we had to actually move to virtual interviewing and videos, interviewings, et cetera. Um, 
and and that's that's the reality we had to deal with. Um, as it relates to the Gen Z, um, and you sort of look at these students in this generation, um, what's really interesting, and I found this uh, little bit of information out on the web, was this gen is, is, is generation is financially focused, entrepreneurial, they're all about technology, they're competitive, they enjoy people, they welcome change, diversity doesn't even register, and they prefer ind independence. So even when you look at the entrepreneurial spirit, the technology, the welcoming of change, um, our president went um, live when he announced that we were going to uh, move forward with our student hiring to say, we want you students to come and reimagine us, reimagine what we can be, reimagine what we can do together. And that's really the culture we're presenting to the students this summer through that student experience. It's all about embracing this change and embracing this opportunity and focusing on those characteristics and skills that this generation has. Um, one of the things I noted yesterday as I talked with 850 students on our uh, virtual um, orientation, our virtual welcome day, and all of us didn't know going into it what to expect, but we decided to treat it with um, professionalism and fun and just sort of get the, the, the students together. One of my reflections on yesterday was I felt there was almost more engagement yesterday than I've ever seen. Why is they very comfortable with technology and chatting and doing things on their phone? Um, if you think about 850 people, and last summer we had over a thousand in a conference room at a hotel in downtown Toronto, uh, I myself was overwhelmed with anxiety looking out at the audience of 800 or 1,000 students as we got up on stage. Um, imagine being a student, raising your hand and asking a question in a team of a, in a, in a pool of a thousand people. Um, there might be the keener or the one person that feels that they want to do that, but generally speaking, on their first day, they're just trying to figure things out. And so from a student experience perspective, I actually gained perspective on this virtual situation yesterday as being more engaging, more real, uh, more questions that we never would have gotten in the, in the, past, uh, uh, the past welcome days that we did or orientations as we used to call them. Um, and it was really interesting to see how this generation embraced what we as professionals or what I um, entered into with a bit of worry and, and, and not sure if it was going to go well. And knowing there was a bunch of people that were in the room from RBC watching what we were doing and delivering, uh, you know, put a little pressure on us and in the machine. But what really showed was our true authentic selves and our really reaching out to the students and the feedback I've gotten on my phone today from students was tremendous that we provided them an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to connect, and an opportunity to see what the culture is really like at RBC. Um, so we learned, right? Um, we learned from this group that um, they're a different generation, they learn differently, they think about things differently, they, they welcome challenge, they welcome change. We also unlearned. And my senior vice president said this on a call a couple weeks ago, what about all the things we're unlearning? And when I reflected on that conversation, we really have unlearned. I, I myself, um, being based in Toronto and hiring students across Canada, I know in the past, you know, majority of our students are in the GTA area. And I know when I look at students being um, outside of the Toronto area or not in the room as I'm delivering a, a, an office hour coffee chat or talking with students and I might have 50 others on the WebEx or on Zoom or whatever the case may be, I really was biased and catered to those in front of me. I really talked to the room and I didn't necessarily talk to those that were outside of the room. So I've unlearned that, that own bias and that own structure of embracing, um, embracing that and, and being there for everyone and also understanding that the technology sometimes doesn't work, the video doesn't work, the camera won't come up. We, we experienced all that yesterday, um, but it, we had fun with it and we realized that this is, this is a new way of working. Yes, there were some cats walking across screens and other things, but this is the way it works. So um, I really started to capture those moments. And I think for all of you, as you start to look at this situation and as we partner together, what are we unlearning together? I would say the best um, thing that we did prior to all the students joining us, um, and can you see the bottom of the screen? Because I know the video's, uh, you can see it okay? Okay, we, um, 
we programmed. So we um, really sat down, uh, we had one month. We sat down and we said, how are we gonna onboard a thousand students um, or over a thousand students across Canada? And how are we gonna get them going? Probably about week two, we, we had to pivot from, okay, we're gonna bring your own device to now we're gonna ship out devices to everyone across Canada, which created a whole nother layer of complexity and accessibility and having tech. And I think the, the question earlier about, it's not speed, it's not productivity, it was really about meeting your team on day one. And we got the tech out and majority of the people had their computers and ready to go, but there were still a few in the week one on May 4th where we were struggling through that. So we programmed um, content and we programmed uh, accessibility for students to also be involved in other things outside of their day job. So one of the things we now are calling RBC virtually together is we developed a plan from day one all the way through offboarding that is being built out every single day by a, a great amount of team members, not just early talent acquisition, but also folks from learning and folks from other parts of RBC that have jumped in to help us. And I couldn't be more grateful uh, for all that support. We also develop days. So Monday is get to know RBC series. So we get to know something else about the bank. Skills Tuesday is focused on more skills building and opportunities for students to focus on those skills. Back to wellness. Wellness Wednesday, we have a bunch of things set up. We have um, medi um, meditation sessions. We have other things that the students can join. Big Idea Thursday is where we get executives and other leaders to come and talk. The very first talk we had was with Katie Dukchuff, who's our head of personal and commercial banking, who went through a personal journey uh, to transition from a man to a woman and lead 25,000 people at RBC. Um, she spoke as our first speaker, and that's the type of uh, opportunities these students are getting on diversity on day one, and I uh, was very proud to be a part of that moment. Um, Bruce Ross, our head of technology, is next week. So we're, we're doing Big Idea Thursday to talk about everything from leadership to diversity to what have you. And then Connection Friday is where we leverage our 10,000 Coffees platform, our RBC Cafe. And we actually have um, bi-weekly meetups or bi-weekly matchups for students to meet someone within RBC, but also with people that um, uh, maybe it's another student. So back to the point about uh, loneliness and, and productivity partners. Um, one of the things we found is by doing an organic matchup of students, they develop that buddy system um, with being matched up with other students as well. Or like they said, if they can't get the attention of their direct manager, the idea that they can reach out to a student who's uh, listed in our platform as having zero to two years experience, they've made that school to work transition and they can lean on them and ask them questions. This platform, and this cafe has gone uh, to, to new heights that I never imagined. And it's delivering on our promise to the students to, to uh, create an environment by which they can learn and they can learn from each other. So really great stuff happening there. Um, the other thing is we have um, a thing called Backpack. And Backpack is basically a student, student developed um, reflection tool that we've now taken across the enterprise as of last summer started out in technology and operations, and now every single student who joins RBC gets a goal setting, a reflection moment, and a performance review, regardless of what program, whether you're a formalized co-op or not, any form of will. Um, all students are treated democratized across the, the enterprise with this experience. And yesterday on day, which was May 13th, it launched for the student in their inbox that day. So they're starting to work on their goals and then they'll meet with their manager and then they'll, they'll agree to those three goals for the summer and go from there. Um, another great thing we found with students in this generation is activation of things with them. So when we did our welcome day yesterday, they had already received an invitation to join the RBC Cafe for me personally. And by 4.30 in the afternoon, over 500 students had already accepted their invitation and started to build their profiles. Amazing, like the amazing interaction and having that in online and doing a quick demo uh, was really great. So, you know what, this is big scale, this is big time, we've done a lot of really cool things, but whether you have platforms or whether you have a backpack, 
all of the things I'm sharing are things that anybody can learn and do. And I think just with a little bit of focus and programming, in addition to the day job, we've created an opportunity for students to be the best that they can be this summer. So for now, we listen. Um, I'm very big on listening strategies. Um, I'll be in this role five years in July. And I would say over the last five years, I've learned more from the students um, in, in what they're seeking and what they can bring to the table and reflect that back in our strategies and the way we engage. So really right now, it's time to listen and it's time to look at the programming and is, is it dialed up too much? Should we dial back? Um, you know, we, we know that first month is going to be a, a different month than a normal month would be in the office. So how do we create those water cooler moments where we actually get to have those collisions and meet up with students because we won't be seeing them in the hallways. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, many things I shared, again, uh, are in support of what you all are, are expecting from at the schools. I think that we're in this together and as we learn more um, this summer and as we reflect, I think we're going to be better prepared as we face the fall and, and more things to come, but thank you for having me. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Shandy. I hope this has been beneficial for everyone. I'd like to invite uh, you to post questions in the Q&A space, bottom center of your uh, screen, Q&A. <clears throat> Got a couple of questions in here already, and uh, I think they're for the institution, but I might open this up to, uh, to Brian as well, but I'll pose it uh, to Shandy perhaps. The first question is, can you share some of the materials you use to assist the students with reflection, evaluation, and feedback? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, the just ones that I shared, um, like I mentioned, we have our six week check in point that we have with our students and the supervisors. So we send that out through our system. So through Waterloo Works is our Orba system that we use, but we invite all of the students and the managers to just give that quick check in at the six week point and then we monitor the responses. So if a supervisor identifies that the student is below expectations, we follow up immediately to find out what's happening. Um, and then same if the student identifies that they're not satisfied or they're not getting support or feedback on the term, we also follow up with that student, again, just to troubleshoot one-on-one -on -one with them and find out what's going on and share what resources that they need. Um, I think our biggest reflection tool is our student consult. So where we'll meet with the students, you know, the summer likely will be virtually, um, but you know, could be through a video chat or a phone call and just checking in. So how is the term going? What have you been working on? What are your learning goals? How have you been achieving them? Is the position what you expected? And again, just really using our toolbox and helping them troubleshoot if it's not. Um, then I guess the final piece is the evaluation. So again, I'm assuming a lot of institutions will use some kind of final evaluation form. We have one that we use at Waterloo. Um, we really encourage students and employers to also complete that at the midterm point then they can use that as their feedback mechanism and also identify any areas you know, of improvement, gives a student time to work on it if they're reviewing it at the midterm. Thank you very much, Shandy. This uh, next question uh, could go to either Brian or, or to either Lauren or Shandy. Do you have examples of ways to share how uh, students can share or demonstrate their ability as they work? with with uh, their employer, I guess in that uh, context that Brian mentioned where they'll come together and share, but you you mentioned it as well, Shandy. Mm -hmm. what, what are some ways that can happen? I, one of the things I didn't mention um, as the programming is we have a tool called Spark, and Spark is a micro-credentialing micro -credentialing tool, whereas students can create a profile. We introduced that yesterday too to them. Um, and they can put their themselves out there and then um, folks can post opportunities. For example, last year I posted, we were redoing our campus recruitment page inside and I needed a UX designer that could help me with graphics and things. And a young lady uh, volunteered off the side of her desk to do that with me and she built, she brought her skills to the table um, and she was able to actually take the hours of work that she did and, and include that back um, as part of her experience. So. Even if you don't have a formalized tool for that, that was one of the things that we're doing as well as sharing with the students so that they can um, 
they can either sign up or, and actually uh, create the profile and we go search, um, or they can actually uh, you know, put out opportunities as well that they're interested in working on. So I think in this world of where we are today, we're really cognizant on um, downtime being something that they can take advantage of and realizing that, again, the productivity and speed will come. But while you're waiting for that, there's other things you could be doing. So um, that's just a, an employer of you of what we're doing. But um, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So I wanted to yeah. share. Yeah. Anything from the institutional side? I would say somewhat added, uh, connected to that question, but also connected to the last question. So, so Shandy had mentioned at Waterloo, there's an end of term performance evaluation as you know many um, institutions and employers have. Um, but in terms of that midterm check-in she mentioned, what one thing that I do with my quote students as well as I know many others do is use that as an opportunity to look at those competencies that are listed at the end of the term and use that as a reflection opportunity for students. So how I walk through that is really have them um, you know, look at each competency and share with me, like, what have they done to demonstrate this competency? And what, what other room is there to grow in that? Like, what else can they do to grow in that? And what opportunities can we provide? So opening that door to, you know, there's maybe more that we can offer, more opportunities that we can um, give you to continue to grow. So going through that and using as, that as a great opportunity for them to share that, you know, some of the amazing work they've done that maybe we haven't you know, maybe we have seen and maybe we haven't seen some of it. So it's a great opportunity to open that. Um, and then also to look ahead and how can we maximize the next, um, you know, month, month or two um, to really benefit the student in learning and growing. Thank you. Here's a question that's it's sort of a big picture question. It's uh, how do you help students understand about the unique work culture at each employer site in, in a remote work environment in the way we're working now. How do you bring that experience? I, I'm happy to share one example. Um, so our, so one of my roles is working really clo closely with our si client support team. So helping any clients that, you know, are hoping to use our services. And so, um, we have two client support representatives that are full time and then one co-op student that joins. And it's really, it's a culture of, you know, just ask any question. There's no wrong question, you know, ask any time, all the time, you know, we're just there to support each other. And it's really friendly, welcoming space. And usually when they're all, you know, in the same space, they just turn to each other and are able to answer those questions. So one thing that we did, um, Thankfully, our last co-op student, she was, you know, working more closely in person with us until March, until we went remote. So when she helped us onboard, we have our co-op students start a week early. So when she helped onboard our new co-op student, she really shared from that student to student on this is who they are. They really want you to reach out. They want those questions. You're not bothering them because, and it's harder to share that when somebody doesn't know you, but that her being able to share that from a student perspective to the next student was so valuable. And then also for us, you know, we've made extra effort to really um, encourage, you know, questions, encourage that instant messaging, encouraging them to reach out um, and just being as welcoming as possible. You know, it is difficult, Bruce, but really just doing our best to say that, you know, we're here and, you know, we all are all in this together and happy to help in any way. So we, we, all of us uh, tend to think of co-op as, as the biggest model we're all following, but it, 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 it occurs, it will happens in so many different ways. I guess this question asks about how do we assess uh, competencies in a student who has to work remotely where normally they would have had to be hands-on, face-to-face, you know, in contact directly with uh, activities, might be an apprentice, might be a kinesiologist. How do we gauge that stumped everybody did I? I I think what we're learning as I said we're learning and we're listening and we're we're figuring this out as we fly the airplane together um, part of it is also looking at expectation setting that was said mm -hmm. earlier by I think it was Jandy and, and it may have been Lauren, but with the expectation setting, we're being really clear and upfront with students that 
we've never done this before. Let's be honest. We've never done virtual internships and we've never done it for a thousand students. So um, for us, we've been just really transparent about how they can go about building their skills and by providing different ways to do that and just encouraging them to make sure that along the way they keep track of all that because you know, they're going to these conversations, they're getting involved in things, um, they're skill building on Tuesday, there's a perfect opportunity to share back with their school what they learned on those days and what they did. Um, so it will happen, it'll just happen differently. And I think um, some of it will be from the actual job they were hired to do, and some of it's gonna be from all of the additional um, opportunities to demonstrate those skills that we've provided. And I think that that's where I would also encourage other, you know, organizations, other people to think about um, how that all comes collectively together to form that experience. It's not just the job you're doing, it's the value you're bringing to that situation. It's also the opportunities to get involved in other things. Like we just put out our, our ask for our student partners and they have this weekend to apply and we told all their managers about it on the exact same day. I've been having manager calls once a week with 700 managers to talk about what we're doing, what's coming out. And they all heard about the student partner program. They can get involved in leadership. They can lead different parts of the student, but they're an extension of my team. I get exposed to them and work with them very directly. Um, so I think students just need to, to put themselves out there and take those opportunities to, um, to drive their career uh, where places are offering that. And then being able to share it back as micro credentialing back to you all. Mm -hmm. Institutions mm -hmm. and say what they did. I think that that's what's going to be different this summer is how do we capture those moments, um, those micro moments where they've done something to be proud about and talk about it and document it. So I have one last question because we're coming up at five minutes to the hour. Uh, here we are. It's uh, yeah, middle of May. We've just got this semester underway. This quarter term. This might be for Brian, but I'd like to hear from everybody. What's offboarding going to look like? What are we going to learn? Mm -hmm. uh, it just made my hair a little grayer, Bruce. <laughs> um, Collecting a thousand devices is going to be interesting. Um, we just got them out the door, so I didn't want to think about that. But no, but but seriously, um, we're hoping that we're going to be able to talk more about conversions to full-time roles. And also, I would like to see what we did see with our winter term students is extensions and continuing students because they actually have the hardware, they know the the, the organization. So where organizations can offer maybe more than just a four month. I'm hoping that we're gonna see more of that. Um, it, it very much happened with winter to summer. Um, so I think, uh, so continuations, uh, hopefully uh, conversions, but also um, as we do truly off board a first or second year student, which we have 50% of those are first and second, they'll go back to school or, or back to what, what it, whatever um, facilities or how that's managed on the institutions end. Um, but it's gonna be different. <laughs> Um, and it's going to come with its complexities, but I think we're ready for it. I think we just have to realize we don't have all the answers and be transparent. Very good. Anything, Lauren, Shandy, on what the end of the semester will look like, projecting to August? Yeah, I think from, again, the practitioner's point of view, it, yeah, it really just is kind of working with those students and having those reflections and checking in with them. Um, I guess for myself, for example, I've been doing that a lot with our winter students that finished at the end of April, or some of them finished unexpectedly mid-March, depending on what their role was. They weren't able to continue working remotely. So it really was, again, a lot of just that one-on-one -on -one conversation, having that reflection with them, you know, a little bit of trying to help them stay positive and, you know, what can you take from this and what are we going to learn from this? And I think we're all just looking at the ways that we're going to develop and grow and get stronger and move forward. So trying to be that support for the student with that. That's excellent. Thank you. One of the uh, the points that came up uh, from the, the attendees was, uh, is there some set of materials we can collect to share to employers 
those that might be smaller than RBC, let's say, uh, to, to guide employers as to how to uh, coach and mentor well their students that are now there. And I, 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 I don't expect you to answer, please do if you wish, but I, I think it sort of behooves Seawill to maybe look to uh, collect these sorts of things and share them out. So uh, I guess I'll invite uh, anybody who wishes to share, our presenters certainly, uh, we'll find a way to collect those. I'm not sure. I think we can direct them right to Seawill if people have those. But that uh, might be something that Watt Case wants to tackle. I don't know. So um, we're coming up uh, just to the end of the hour. So let me do this. Let me thank the three of you just immensely because this has really been an amazing topic area. I think everybody knew that this was necessary. And here we are in May and we're delivering it. It's happening. There's a thousand students at RBC and there's probably 15,000 students elsewhere. And uh, I think we're in a small way, we're understanding how to make them a little bit more successful. So I thank Lauren, Shandy, Ryan for being part of this. I do wanna say uh, with a little bit of a pitch, the next PD committee webinar is probably about two weeks away and we're gonna be talking about service learning. So community service learning as it's sometimes known. That's just coming together, registration details, and uh, a little bit more about who's presenting should be out in the next week or so, so look for that. Uh, that's about it. I just would like to say personally that, I, again, I appreciate everybody's contribution this afternoon. And I just would like for everybody to be safe and healthy. And if you've already had COVID, Brian, great, you're off the hook, uh, but uh, let's everybody try and look after everybody else. Thanks very much from the PD committee. Bye and out.